Hey everybody, in this video we'll be discussing Atomic Absorption Spectroscopy, AAS. Before we discuss AAS, which is the topic of this video, I want to quickly discuss the concept of spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is the interaction between radiation and matter. This is when electrons in an atom can absorb a discrete amount of energy to transition or to be excited to a higher energy orbit. And the energy that's being absorbed by the electrons is always equal to the difference in energy between the orbits of transitioning. It's important to remind yourself that orbits of different elements have different energy levels. This causes the amount of energy that is absorbed by the electrons to be very different between elements. When these excited electrons return to the ground state, that is their original orbit, they will emit the same amount of energy that was previously absorbed in the form of electromagnetic radiation, EMR. And since the amount of energy absorbed varies between different elements, the amount that's being released by these elements is also different. Atomic Absorption Spectroscopy, AAS for short, is a quantitative technique that analyzes the concentration of metal ions in a sample by the use of spectroscopy. Electrons in metal ions and atoms can absorb EMR to transition to a higher energy orbit as shown in the diagram here. AAS relies on the fact that the quantity of metal ions determines the amount of energy absorbed. More metal ions there are, the greater the absorption. AAS is a very sensitive technique as it is able to use the amount of EMR absorbed to detect and measure the presence of metal species even when they are in small traces. The relationship between the amount of metal ion or atom present in a sample and the extent to which EMR is absorbed is described by Beer-Lambert law. Beer-Lambert law states that the absorption of EMR is directly proportional to the concentration of metal ions or atom present in the given sample. Lower the concentration means less absorbance and higher the concentration of metal ions or atoms means more absorbance. Thus, by measuring the amount of EMR that is absorbed, we can calculate the exact concentration of a particular metal. Besides being very sensitive, another advantage of AAS is that it is able to analyze the concentration of a particular metal at a given time, even when there are multiple metals present in a sample. This is because the amount of EMR absorbed by metals is determined by the energy difference between orbits in the metal's atomic structure. Since every metal atom has a different structure, for example, atomic radius, as shown by these two metal atoms, the amount of energy of EMR that is absorbed varies. For example, metal 1 here will absorb a small amount of radiation, and metal 2 will absorb a greater amount of EMR. Therefore, AAS also provides for highly specific analysis of a sample that contains more than one metal species. Building on the specific nature of AAS from before, the energy of radiation is directly proportional to the radiation's frequency. So higher the frequency, the more energy the radiation has. This also means shorter the wavelength, the more energy the radiation has. Since metals absorb EMR of different energies, EMR of different wavelengths is used to analyze each metal. Again, this is due to the fact that energy levels of orbits are intrinsically different among metals of different kinds. In this table, four examples of metals and their characteristic wavelengths of EMR are shown. For example, copper atoms can absorb EMR of a wavelength of 224.8 nanometers, whereas another metal, like lead, absorbs EMR of 217 nanometers. What you should take away from this part of the video is that before we analyze the concentration of a particular metal using AAS, we need to know what wavelength of EMR the metal can absorb at. We have now discussed the underlying principle of AAS. Now it's time to talk through the various components of an AAS setup and their functions. This includes a hollow cathode lamp, flamed atomizer and nebulizer, a monochromator, and finally a detector that receives the EMR. The hollow cathode lamp is a device that produces the EMR that's required for exciting electrons in the metal atom. The cathode of this device is always made from the same metal element as what is to be analyzed in the sample. For example, 
if we want to analyze the amount of lead present in a sample water, we want to use a hollow cathode lamp made from a lead metal. You need to understand why this requirement is important. The metal atoms of the cathode are excited, which means their electrons absorb energy to reach a high energy orbit. Now, these excited metal atoms can return to the ground state, releasing EMR that is specific to the metal. This is a critical component of AAS, as we said earlier, that in order to measure the concentration of a metal, we first need to find out what wavelength of EMR the metal can absorb. Well, in this case, the hollow cathode lamp produces an EMR from the metal that is the same as what is to be analyzed. For example, the wavelength of EMR produced when excited lead atoms return to the ground state will be identical as that of EMR absorbed by lead atoms in a sample of water. This is why it's important to use a hollow cathode lamp made from the same metal that is to be analyzed in the sample. A nebulizer sprays a liquid sample which contains the metal we want to measure into the flame. Now, in AAS, the flame is responsible for converting metal species in the sample into metal atoms in the ground state. That is, metal atoms whose electrons are in their normal orbits, not yet excited. This is why the flame is referred to as the atomizer. The EMR produced from the hollow cathode lamp is passed through the hottest part of the flame, where metal atoms in the ground state are present. Of course, since the EMR produced by the hollow cathode lamp is characteristic of the metal that we are analyzing in the flame, the metal atoms in the flame will absorb this EMR to reach an excited state. Due to the absorption of EMR by the metal atoms in the flame, the amount of EMR before the flame is always going to be higher than what comes out of the flame. We can describe this using intensity of EMR. Thus, the original intensity of EMR, I0, is greater than the new intensity of EMR that comes out of the flame. The Beer-Lambert law tells us that the extent to which EMR is absorbed depends on the concentration of the metal in a sample. So, when there are more metal atoms in the flame, more EMR will be absorbed, causing less EMR to exit the flame. This means the final intensity I of the EMR will be even smaller. Now, all of this can be summarized by the mathematical formula of B. Lambert's law, where the absorbance is equal to the log function of the original intensity I0 divided by the final intensity of EMR that exits the flame. This logarithmic expression also equals to epsilon multiplied by concentration multiplied by L, which is the path length of the flame. In this formula, epsilon is known as the extinction coefficient. This is the absorptive property of the metal sample that we are analyzing. The path length is the distance in the flame through which the EMR has to travel. As you can imagine, the longer the length here, the more absorption will happen by the metal atoms. This is why absorbance A also depends on length in addition to concentration of metal atoms. The EMR that exits a flame is passed through a monochromator. A monochromator's only job is to receive the EMR with the wavelength that is characteristic of the metal that we are analyzing, while eliminating every other sources of EMR. This includes background EMR such as visible light. By eliminating other sources of EMR that we don't want to analyze, we allow the detector that's behind the monochromator to analyze the intensity of the characteristic wavelength that belongs to the metal atom. For example, if we are analyzing a metal species which absorbs EMR at 250 nanometers, we will use the hollow cathode lamp made of the same metal to produce the 250 nanometer EMR. This then passes through the flame, which contains the metal atoms that will absorb some amount of this 250 nanometer radiation, which decreases its intensity as it exits the flame. The monochromator then filters all radiation but the 250 nanometer radiation. This allows the detector behind it to measure the intensity of this particular radiation. Finally, the absorbance is calculated using Beer Lambert's law, comparing the final intensity with the initial intensity I0. Let's summarize everything we have discussed so far in an example. Let's say we want to analyze the lead concentration in a particular water sample. 
we want to first find out what wavelength we want to use for lead. In the table, as we saw earlier, lead atoms absorb a characteristic wavelength of 270 nanometers. So we'll then use a hollow cathode lamp that's made of lead to produce this special EMR. And as the EMR passes through the flame, which atomizes the water sample, part of the radiation is absorbed by the lead atoms as present. When the EMR exits a flame, it is passed through a monochromator, which only receives radiation of 270 nanometers. Then the detector will measure the intensity of this radiation to calculate the absorbance. And just as an example, the absorbance of the water sample is 0.58. Now, how can we use this absorbance value to actually calculate the concentration of lead ions in my water sample? Before we can calculate the concentration, we must first create various standard solutions containing the same metal ion that we are analyzing. So in this case, lead. The absorbance of these solutions are measured in AAS and plotted on the graph against concentration of the standard solution, as you can see here. Then a line of best fit is constructed using these data points. The reason why we are doing this is so that when we obtain the absorbance value of the water sample, whose concentration of a particular metal is unknown, we can use the line of best fit to find the corresponding concentration. This graph that we have just constructed is referred to as the calibration curve of AAS. Here's an example of the absorbance values of various standard solutions of lead ions. I have made six standard solutions with various concentrations of lead ions. And by analyzing these six solutions in AAS, I have obtained six different absorbance values for the solutions. These are then plotted on a graph with the absorbance on the y-axis against the concentration of the standard solutions on the x-axis to allow for the construction of a line of best fit. Now, I can use this line of best fit to determine the concentration of lead ions in my water sample. An absorbance value of 0.58 that I obtained previously gives me a concentration of 3.5 parts per million ppm by using the calibration curve. The unit ppm parts per million is a very common unit in the setting of AAS as we emphasized earlier that AAS is a very sensitive technique. So we are able to use it to quantify the concentration of metals in very, very small traces or low concentrations of any sample. One ppm is equivalent to one milligram of the metal per liter of solvent. This concludes the video on AAS.